Hello guys, it's Johnny Time and welcome to another Web3 security video. $200,000 at stake in the Munify boost, the eBTC boost by Badger DAO. And in today's video, we're gonna go through everything you need to know before starting this amazing Immunify boost. First, we'll cover what are Immunify boosts and in this particular eBTC, what are the terms for this boost. Then we'll go through a high level overview of the eBTC protocol so you understand everything that you need to know before getting started with the boost. We'll go through every main smart contract of the protocol and understand its purpose. We will check the previous audits that conducted to eBTC protocol and we will see which issues were reported and fixed. Now I highly recommend you to stick till the end of this video because I'm gonna share with you some potential attack vectors that I think might be interesting and also some pro tips and ideas to get started with this eBTC boost. Immunify boost similar to auditing contests is time bounded, which means that you have certain amount of time to find issues and report them for a specific protocol. Now during this time box, you will have direct project support from uh, the team project from the eBTC team in the private Discord of Immunify, private Discord channel inside the Immunify Discord, which is something that you don't usually have when it comes to traditional bug hunting. In addition, they're gonna be a custom leaderboard for this particular boost. And also you're gonna have immediate Immunify triage less than 24 hours. So the response rate is gonna be very fast and the feedback loop gonna be awesome. And also the cool thing is you get paid for duplicate. So similar to auditing contest here, unlike traditional bug hunting in Immunify, you get rewards and you get payments for duplicates. And this eBTC boost that this video is about is gonna last two weeks from today, 19th February till 4th of March. The scope is around 5,000 lines of Solidity code and the reward pot is gonna be as follows. If a critical vulnerability is found within the code base, then the rewards gonna be $200,000. If a high was found, then the rewards will be $100,000. And if there are no highs and criticals found in the repository, then they're gonna be 50K dollars in rewards. And now we're gonna go through the eBTC protocol overview so you have some kind of starting point to start with this Immunify boost and I'm sure it's gonna simplify things for you. So this is the eBTC Twitter account and eBTC lives on the Ethereum network. It's Bitcoin on Ethereum similar to WBTC wrapped BTC. So why BTC on Ethereum is cool? Because you can get yield on your Bitcoin. You can easily swap it to stable coins or any other tokens or even Ethereum and you don't need to pay high gas fees. Now, this doesn't go to Ethereum, but to other cheaper EVM chains like Layer 2s, like Optimism, Arbitrum, or maybe even Binance chain, uh, because in Ethereum, the fees are quite high and quite similar to BTC. But imagine that you can use Rub BTC in Ethereum when the fees will be lower or on other EVM-based chains, and you can easily swap it to other tokens, earn in all, all the BTC. So Rub BTC and in general, BTC on Ethereum is cool. So you probably heard about Rub BTC. Rub BTC is quite centralized because we have an allow list of certain actors that can deposit and withdraw Bitcoin to wrap Bitcoin, right? You can see here, this is from the wrap BTC website. I will put all the links in the description below so you can see it yourself. We have on the network, which means on uh, Ethereum ERC20 tokens, we have around 157K wrap BTC. And also we have Bitcoin, real native Bitcoin held in custody, the same amount of Bitcoin. And you can see here all these actors, Wintermute, Hashhub, Wintermute, Tokalabs, they can, uh, using probably the Rub BTC uh, API to deposit Bitcoin and mint Rub BTC or redeem Rub BTC, right, to burn. You can see here this burn mark that Wintermute burned 872 Rub BTC and received BTC. So it's pretty centralized, right? We have this entity, RabBTC, that allows other actors to burn and mint uh, RabBTC, and it's backed by real BTC. When it comes to eBTC, you don't need proof of assets, and you don't need 
allowed actors to deposit and withdraw because it's completely decentralized token to BTC on Ethereum blockchain. And in this video, we'll understand exactly how it works, how the magic works. And the way it works is that you can deposit STEs, staked ETH, and then borrow EBTC or mint EBTC in exchange. And it's always going to be over collateralized. So all the minted EBTC tokens are always backed by real value, by real collateral, by stacked ETH. In order to borrow this EBTC from the system, you have to deposit more collateral, minimum 110%. So if you want to borrow one BTC, you will need to deposit 1.1 worth of Bitcoin in staked ETH. So it's always secure and over collateralized. So we don't have any centralized system or API to uh, redeem or, or mint a uh, raw BTC. We have only immutable smart contracts that are controlled by minimized governance. We also don't have fees when we want to mint EBTC and borrow from the system EBTC. And the EBTC protocol by BadgerDAO is a fork or you can say also based on the liquidity protocol. So they made a lot of chance since they forked the code from liquidity protocol. That's why I cannot really say that it's a fork, but more like based on. But I'm certain that if you are familiar with how liquidity protocol works, you will have some advantage in this Immunify Boost. So before we dive into the actual protocol overview, I want you to understand some terms that are super important because you're going to see them all over the place in the documentation, in the smart contracts. And the first term is CDP. CDP is a very known term when it comes to DeFi and it's called collateralized debt position. You're probably familiar with other CDP protocols like MakerDAO, Liquity, Curve USD, and these, these are called CDP protocol, collateral debt position. For example, in MakerDAO, you deposit collateral and then you borrow DAI. In Liquity, you deposit collateral and then you borrow LUSD. LUSD is like similar to DAI, the stablecoin of Liquity. And in this EBDC protocol, you deposit SDETH as your collateral and you borrow and mint EBTC. So this is called collateral debt position. Other important terms for this protocol are ICR, individual collateralization ratio, which is the collateralization ratio for a specific CDP. And we also have TCR, total collateralization ratio, which basically determines how healthy is the system, what is the total collateral of the system compared to the mint debt, EBTC is the minted debt. And we have also MCR, minimum collateralization ratio. So these are terms that are super important when it comes to understand how EBTC work and navigating through this Immunify boost. The most basic features in a CDP system is either borrow and mint, which means to open a new CDP so you can deposit staked ETH and then you get EBTC in exchange. Now, the thing with EBTC protocol is the minimum amount of staked ETH is going to be two staked ETH. So you cannot deposit less than two staked ETH and you cannot open a CDP that is smaller than two staked ETH. Also, you have to pay extra 0.2 staked ETH for gas stipend. You will see later why you need to add this extra uh, gas stipend 0.2 ETH to make sure that the liquidator have some incentive and he gets back some of these gas fees if he's going to liquidate a position, basically to incentivize liquidators. But no worries, when you deposit staked ETH and you close your CDP and it's healthy, you're going to pay get paid back this 0.2 stake ETH that you deposit in, in addition to the original amount. And then you can always redeem and burn your EBTC. So you can come to the system back and then you can give back your EBTC to the system and get back your collateral in staked ETH. Now you can do full repayment, which means that your CDP, your collateral debt position is getting closed or you can also partially pay your debt to make your position healthier. So you will have less debt compared to your collateral. So these are the main mechanism to make sure that the peg and the system health system, the health in the system is stable. Now, the best way to understand the system, in my opinion, is take a look at the UX. And this is some screenshots from the front end of the testnet eBTC. And here you can see, this is how you can open a new CDP. You can specify how many staked ETH you want to deposit. Again, minimum two, you cannot deposit less than two. You can also choose your collateralization ratio, which means 
how many EBTC you're gonna borrow from the system based on this collateral that you deposit. 125% is the minimum collateralization ratio and this is very risky, very high risk. It means that uh, if EBTC goes up in price, if Bitcoin goes up in, in price compared to staked ETH or to Ether, then you might get liquidated. Then you can borrow the EBTC from the system after depositing the staked ETH. Then you can go to the position page positions page and manage all your open CDPs positions basically you can click manage and you, you can either deposit more collateral in staked ETH to make your CDP healthier or you can withdraw some of the collateral if BTC dropped in price compared to Ether and you can also go to the debt tab you can pay back some of your EBTC or borrow more EBTC compared to the collateral that you deposited so it's Pretty simple, it's quite similar to lending protocols, right? Because you can deposit collateral and borrow another token, but the difference here that it's actually means the token for you, this is why it's called CDP, collateral debt position, and it's quite more similar to MakerDAO and DAI. Now, the thing with CDP is that they usually need to have some kind of Oracle system that will provide a price feed because at any point of time, they need to know what is the price of a Bitcoin and what is the price of ETH to know the ratio between them so they can measure like what is your collateral compared to your debt. And that's where Oracle's comes in. So in the EBT system, system we have primary Oracle, which is fixed address forever. It cannot be changed by protocol governance. And it's two chaining fins, one BTC price compared to ETH and one staked ETH compared to ETH. So as you know, staked ETH is ST ETH. It means ETH that earns yield through rebasing and staked ETH usually gonna worth more than ETH. So we need to make these two conversions from staked ETH to ETH and BTC to ETH to understand the ratio between Bitcoin to ETH, which are the two assets that we are talking about in this protocol. Now, the cool thing about the system that we have also a backup protocol, so it's quite immutable and quite decentralized. But in case the primary oracle fails, something goes wrong with Chainlink or this particular price fits, we have a backup oracle that can be set by governance. So in case something goes wrong, we always have a fresh updated price feed. The thing is that currently this backup oracle is not set yet, so it's some kind of far-fetched plan and the system is already developed to support this oracle, but it's not set at the moment. Now, there is another cool thing with EBTC, which is something that they took from Liquidity Protocol, is the way that redemptions are working. So when you try to redeem your position, to redeem your EBTC and get back STETH as collateral, you're not going to take it from your position, but the way the system works that it always sorts all the CDPs from the riskier CDP to the less riskier CDP. And you're going to get the collateral of the riskier CDP first. This is how the system keeps the system in a healthy state and Risky position first get redeemed before the less risky positions. We're not going to go through how this algorithm works, but you can explore further the documentation and the smart contracts. But basically, first it gets the riskier position to redeem. And lastly, it's a list. It's like a sorted list. So first the riskiers are being uh, redeemed and then the less riskier and less riskier and less riskier. Now, when you redeem your EBTC, when you pay back the EBTC for the to the protocol, it's getting burned and you get back your collateral, there is a fee. It starts from 1% and it goes up the more people are trying to redeem the EBDC. Again, this is another safety mechanism and algorithm that is implemented in liquidity protocol. And so just bear in mind that there is this kind of fee, 1%, that the more people, the more volume is coming in to, to redeem the EBDC tokens, this fee might go up and up. And this is an awesome diagram from the docs. You can check them out of how redemptions work. So we have the redeemer that want to redeem the EBDC and get back the collateral. The protocol redeems against the riskiest CDP and burns the EBDC upon receipt. So again, it takes the riskier collateral deposition 
redeems the EBC and get back the collateral from this CDP. So since the CDP is from another borrower, that his CDP is risky, and now the question that we want to ask is what happens to his collateral and to his debt? So the borrower with this riskier CDP returns the EBTC, he still has the debt, he still has the EBTC, and any leftover collateral. So some of the collateral might pay it back to this kind of Alice whatever redeemer and some of it is left in the original CDP. The risky CDP probably might be redeemed later because it might be still risky. Uh, but this is what happens with this risky CDP position. The EBTC system also have uh, liquidations and when your ICR, remember what is ICR, individual collateralization ratio, which means the collateralization ratio of a certain CDP goes below 110%. So you, the minimum is 125, but you know what happens when BTC goes up in price, if it goes down in price, this uh, ICR, this collateralization ratio might go down. And if it goes below 110%, your position can be liquidated. liquidated. Now, the way liquidation works is a bit different than liquidity. And every time there is something different than, than liquidity, I put here in this bold orange color because this is something that you definitely want to explore when it comes to auditing the code base and reviewing the security of the code base in this particular boost. And the way that liquidation works is that you can first do full liquidation, which means liquidate an entire CDP that is underwater and get all the collateral, pay all the debt. You can also do partial liquidation. But again, you need to make sure that there is no less than two staked ETH left in the CDP. So if the CDP was 10 ETH, you can do partial liquidation of 8 ETH maximum. You cannot do 8.1 because then there will be 1.9 ETH ETH left and it's basically below the minimum of two staked ETH. Now, the premium that the liquidator is going to get is going to be dynamic. It's going to range between 3 to 10%. And this is something that is, again, different than the way liquidity works. And it's in place in order to reduce the bad debt in the system and to offer a nice premium and free liquidation markets for the liquidators. So the system health will always be good. And this is another awesome diagram from the docs. So if the ICR goes below 110%, it's subject to liquidation and the liquidators receive the collateral and at a 3% to 10% discount. Now we're not going to go through the liquidation algorithm and the way it's being priced the collateral because this is your job right in this boost to explore the smart contracts in depth find, take a look how the algorithm works and maybe find flaws, security flaws in it. And once the liquidation happens, the CDP, the debt position is closed and the overall health of the system is improved because we are basically liquidating um, positions that are below 110%, the minimum collateralization ratio of the system. Now, another thing that EBTC team, the Badger Tower team added to the system that is different than liquidity is something called recovery mode. So remember the term, TCR, total collateralization ratio, uh, which basically represent the collateralization ratio of the whole system. Now, if this value goes below 125%, uh, then we go into recovery mode, as you can see here. And recovery mode means that we want to improve the overall health of the system. And therefore, any ICR, any CDP that uh, the collateralization ratio is below 125%, not 110% can be liquidated. So we have less tolerance for open CDPs. We liquidate when it goes below 125% when the overall system is in lower than 125%, which means that we are in recovery mode. During recovery mode, borrowing is disabled, so people cannot open new CDPs. And we also have something called grace period. We want to prevent people that are actively more monitoring and working on their CDPs from being liquidated and paying those penalties of three to five to ten percent. So they have 15 minutes grace periods, which means that if they added some collateral or removed some uh, some debt, every action that they are doing, they have 15 minutes grace period where their position, their CDP, cannot be liquidated. Now this grace period only works for healthy CDPs that are above. 
110%. If your CDP is completely screwed up, like, I don't know, 105% or even 90%, then you're not going to get this grace period, right? Only if you're... Um, somehow you got between the, the lines, you know, your collateralization ratio, let's say is 120%, it's still quite healthy, and you're actively monitoring and adding collateral or removing debt, then you're gonna enjoy from this grace period for this recovery mode. Another cool thing that was added to the system is flash loans. Flash loans are great to do leverage, to do atomic liquidations, and EBTC team added ERC-3156 compat compatibility, which is the flash loan standard uh, for flash loans, and you can both flash borrow staked ETH, which means that all the collateral that is deposited in the system, all the staked ETH is available for users to take. It could be hundred millions of dollars or maybe even billions of dollars, depends on the TV of the system as soon as you pay it back on the same transaction with some kind of fee. You can also do flash mint EBTC, which means that the protocol is going to mint for you EBTC first and then going to check your collateral. So this is super cool for automations, for leverage, for atomic liquidation and plenty of other awesome things. So when you audit the code and when you do this boost, bear in mind that these flash loans are supported and maybe try to think how you can take advantage of them as a malicious attacker with malicious intentions. Another cool thing that exists in EBDC that they added to the protocol is position managers, which allows you basically to build on top of EBTC. What it means is that you can delegate your CDP management to another address. You can delegate it to another EOA account or even better to a smart contract and delegating the management of your CDPs opens up possibilities of cool automations. For example, topping up your collateral to make sure the collateral is safe or maybe redeem and pay back some of the EPTC, some of your debt to make sure you'll not get liquidated or maybe do some kind of emergency close CDPs. Everything could happen, everything on your mind and this is being allowed through permit-based signature approvals. So basically you can delegate your CDP management to another account by giving them a signature, permit based, or just giving them allowance. And this is something similar that we see in ERC20 tokens, but they also did it for CDPs and it's something pretty innovative and cool. So these are the main parts of the EBTC system. And now we're going to deep dive into some of the main smart contracts to see how this architecture is being implemented in the smart contracts themselves. Now, the first smart contract, which is the entry point for the protocol, is called borrowerOperations.sol. This is the main entry point for, for user. It's a user-facing contract. So most of the user-facing, the DAP-facing functions are in this smart contract, such as OpenCDP, CDP. Um, we also have some internal functions. Basically, we have these external functions that receive the call from the user and then they run the internal function to execute some kind of logic like such as adjust CDP internal, which is responsible for the internal accounting and logic of the CDP. Also, the delegations that we dis discussed previously, the position manager is also implemented in this smart contract and also this Smart contract supports flash minting of eBTC logic. So when you open CDP, you can flash mint eBTC. Now, the next important contracts are the CDP manager.sol and the CDP manager storage.sol. These contracts, the storage, the CDP manager and its storage are responsible for all the accounting of all the CDP in the systems. Also, uh, if you want to activate liquidations and redemptions of collateral, this is the contract that you're going to use. And the fact that they don't charge fee to open position is thanks to the fact that they get some of the fee of the staked ETH. So staked ETH generates fees all the time. ST ETH is a rebase token and the staking rewards are going to be reflected in the token balance. And when you deposit your ST ETH on EBTC, the protocol is going to take some of these fees to the protocol treasury uh, in order to cover expenses and make some profits. And therefore, it allows 0% fees when it comes to opening new CDP. So this is something super cool that uh, is added to the protocol that is different than liquidity. Ahem, ahem, you might want to check it. 
and also the recovery mode and the grace period, all the implementation, the logic, when it's going to get into recovery mode, in the grace period enforcement is happening in those uh, man CDP manager contracts. Now, the CDP manager contract is using the liquidation library and the liquidation sequencers, which brings me to the next topic, which is the liquidation contract. So we have liquidation library.sol, we have liquidation sequencer, all the liquidation logic gonna go into this contract. We also have this contract that is called sync liquidation sequencer, uh, that basically allows user to do batch liquidation. So if there are multiple positions that are under collateralized, you can liquidate all of them in one transaction, which is super cool to save transaction fees and save some gas. And remember that we said that upon redemption, the CDPs are sorted by from less riskier to the most riskier. Well, this is a smart contract that is responsible for that, the sorted CDPs.sol. You can dive deeper into this smart contract if you want to explore how this algorithm works or maybe to find some flaws in this algorithm. Obviously, we have the eBTC token, which is an ERC classic token. We also have some block list uh, functionality, so we can block some important contracts like the core eBTC contract or other contracts as well. But it's in general, it's a traditional ERC20 token implementation, uh, but you can explore this contract as well. Maybe you'll find some flaws inside. We have also this eBTC deployer.sol contract, which is something pretty cool. They use Create3. If you are not familiar with Create3, it's exactly like Create2, which means that you can predict the deploy, the deterministic, the deterministic deployed smart contract address, but the difference is that the address is not dependent on the contract bytecode. We know that in Create2, the address will be calculated based on the contract bytecode, the salt and the message sender, the one who deploys the contract. Now in Create3, it's not going to be dependent on the bytecode, but only in the, on the salt and the message sender. So we can take a look at this smart contract and see how the deployment of all the other contracts looks like and how to use Create3 to determine the address before they actually deploy the contracts. We also have the treasury that receives all the fees, both from the redemptions and also from the staked ETH yield. Now we have this smart contract called fee recipient, which is a simple smart contract that's going to receive ERC20 tokens. And the owner can come at any point of time. Probably the owner is going to be a multi-sig wallet or an MCP that can sweep all the tokens to his whatever address to pay for devs or marketing or whatever. So this is how the treasury is working and how the fees are being collected. Now, remember the phrase, show me the money. Where is the money being held? Right here, activepool.sol. The activepool.sol smart contract holds all the STEs collateral, all the liquidity of the STEs that was deposited into the system in order to mint EBDC tokens. Uh, also, the state of the debt, the total debt, total EBTC tokens that were minted is being stored in this smart contract. And also, if you want to make flash loans and get all the collateral for a fraction of second in an atomic transaction, this is the entry point and this is the smart contract that you're going to work with. This is the STETH flash loan logic is right there. We also have this smart contract that holds some of the STETH collateral in some edge cases where a CDP is being liquidated or redeemed and there is a leftover of the collateral. Remember we talked about this scenario earlier? So this smart contract is going to hold this remaining collateral that wasn't redeemed or liquidated. So the owner can come, the owner of this CDP can come and claim it. So once a CDP is being redeemed or liquidated, the collateral is moving from the active pool to the call surplus pool. And of course, we have the price feeds to fetch the EBTC, the BTC, sorry, price and the staked ETH to ETH price. And we use Chainlink oracles this is the file pricefeed.sol that you can explore. We have also second, secondary fallback oracles that are not used at the moment, but the logic of the secondary fallback is already implemented in the pricefeed.sol. This is also in scope, so you can check this smart contract and understand if there are flaws in the fallback mechanism, in the primary or oracle or the secondary oracle. And we also have the governance contract. So we have the governor.sol 
So again, you can go to the smart contracts and deep dive on how they work. There are a lot of useful comments along the contracts, along the functions, so I'm sure it will be quite easy for you to navigate. This is a high level overview of the system and the main contracts, so you get a good starting point. But obviously, we're not going to dive into every single smart contract. And we have some helper contracts, of course. So we have hint helpers, we have multi CDP getter and CL lens. Some of these contracts are for invariant testing, some of them are general helpers, some of them from the front end. So these are just some of the helper contracts. This is the repo. We covered most of the contracts that you can see over here, the CDP manager, the CDP manager of storage, you know, the deployer, the, the CL lens. Most of the smart contracts were covered and now you have a very good first idea about this repository. Now the fun part starts. We're gonna discuss some previous audits that were conducted to the protocol, potential issues and pro tips and ideas. So let's start with previous audits. As you can see, BadgerDAO and eBDC taking security very, very seriously. So around May, I think, there was a risk DAO audit, which means that they basically ran a lot of parameters to determine governance parameters that will make the system safe, like collateralization ratio, minimum collateralization ratio, the recovery mode parameters, all these parameters were analyzed, analyzed by risk DAO. So this is the risk DAO audit over here, which you can explore. And I will put the link in the description below. Uh, they did a, a audit in trust audit, the trust team audit. You're probably familiar with trust is very famous in the space. They also did an audit with Spearbit and Cantina as well. Let's take a look at the timeline on, on when these audits took place. So on May 2023, there was the risk down analysis with simulations and modeling to come with good parameters for the system to be healthy. Then on August 2023, there was a Spearbit audit. Nine highs and eight mediums were found on the code base. Some of them were fixed and some of them probably were acknowledged. This is your job to check. Then in August 2023, in simultaneously, I guess there was also a Cantina audit um, where three highs and three mediums were detected. One month later, on September, Trust Security performed another audit for the protocol one high, eight mediums, and the most recent one where the report just recently been published was in October 2023, the Codarina C4 contest when where one high and six mediums were found. So you can see how the protocol security goes better and better in at more time passes. And it's very interesting to see how many highs, criticals, or mediums, or any other issues will be found on this Immunify boost because definitely EBDC are taking security seriously. Now let's discuss some potential attack vectors when it comes to the EBTC protocol that you want as a security researcher to check and make sure that they're not feasible. When I talk about attack vectors, I like to define them and divide them into categories. So three categories. One is that the protocol lose money, you know, some kind of huge, big, scary heist when all the STE collateral is being stolen or someone can mint a lot of EBTC tokens and then dump them into the liquidity, into the market and crash the protocol. So these are the most critical one. Uh, there is another category that is a bit less critical where users lose money, right? When certain user lose money maybe because he is not treated fairly by the protocol, maybe because some other user attacked the, his CDP and got money. And the last category is denial of service type slash griefing attacks. When someone is just, you know, hater trying to screw the protocol to make it, to break it, to make sure CDPs cannot be redeemed or no one can open positions or money is stuck in the contracts. So these are DOS and griefing attacks. And here are some uh, areas that I thought of that you might want to explore. You can treat it as checklist and you can also come up with more areas. These are just ideas that came out of my head, but I'm sure there are plenty of more ideas that you can explore. So first thing is maybe price feed and Oracle manipulation. Maybe you can leverage the flash loans and flash means or maybe flash loans in other protocols to affect the prices or maybe there is something pro broken with the price feeds or the way they are being implemented and maybe you can do some kind of price feed or price manipulations 
to steal money from the system, to break the system. Another unique thing to the system is that it collects fee from the staked ETH, from the STETH rewards. Maybe there are some logical issues or accounting issues between the balance and the share. So if you're familiar with STETH token and staked ETH and Lido, this is an advantage for sure. Another thing that I want you to think about is front running attacks. What happens when you front run users? when they open a CDP, when they redeem some of their some of their eBTC tokens, when, maybe when they add collateral, maybe you can front run liquidators, always put it in mind what happens when you front run other users, can you harm them, can you harm the system, can you make some profit, can you do a denial of service attack maybe, and liquidations and also redeeming is a, a, a point where problems might arise because again, they have their unique linked uh, list protocol to order those CDP, CDPs of which CDPs are being liquidated. Also, there is the whole algorithm of how liquidation happens, of how the premium is being defined for the liquidator. So it's definitely worth exploring the liquidation and see maybe there are some logical issues over there. Also, the enough service attacks. Maybe you can break the whole protocol from working. Maybe you can prevent your CDP or other CDP from being liquidated and create bad debt to the system. All these kind of griefing and DOS attacks. Think also about governance attacks. Maybe there are certain parameters that might break the protocol that can be set from governance. Maybe there is some kind of malicious takeover that you can do through governance. Uh, maybe there is also some staked ETH edge cases since it's a rebase token and it doesn't work as, you know, other collateral that is CDP are based on. So maybe something with the way staked ETH work. This is just general ideas and checklists that you can go through uh, while doing this boost and maybe find some issues in the code base. Now, I want to share with you some of my ideas when it comes to this EBTC boost and some tips that might help you to perform better in this boost. So the first tip that I want to give you is to compare the EBTC code base to liquidity, to explore new functionalities that were added on top of liquidity, because liquidity is a battle tested protocol with billions of dollars and in TVL. So you want to focus on the deltas, on the new functionalities, the removed functionalities, right? Maybe they removed some functionalities that are critical to the way the system works. Maybe they changed some of the logic in the eBTC protocol, so it's always good to compare it to the original forked version, the battle-tested version with a lot of TVL. And I want to remind you that eBTC is yet to be deployed. So it means that it doesn't have a TVL, it gone through security reviews, it, it gone through fuzzing and formal verification, but it still doesn't have money, like liquidity. That's why I wouldn't focus on some ish, on the liquidity code base, but on the new features. Now, these are changes that I listed here that are different from the way liquidity work, but obviously there might be more things that are different. This is just some kind of list for you to get started. So first of all, EBTC is using uh, EBTC instead of LUSD. LUSD in liquidity is a stable coin that is pegged to dollar. EBTC is pegged to Bitcoin. And you can always remember that USD is not volatile and BTC is a volatile asset that his price is always changing all the time. Also, the collateral type is quite unique and quite different. We have here STETH, and we also take some fee on this STETH yield. This is something new that was introduced to EBTC that does not exist in liquidity. Maybe you can find some flaws in this new position manager implementation on the fact that you can delegate your CDP management to other addresses. Maybe there are some issues there. Also, the fact that the liquidation, the way liquidation works and that the premium that the liquidators are getting is dynamic and can be changed between 3 to 10%. This is also something you need and something new. This whole recovery mode where all the system gets into recovery mode and there is also the grace period. Maybe you can somehow exploit the system when it's in recovery mode. Maybe uh, you can do it in out of service and always be in grace period and prevent from being liquidated. You know, these are just some ideas that pop into my head and I want you to adopt your attacker mindset and take a look at all these new functionalities and try to think how you can break them and take advantage of them. Also, the fact that they allow flash loans and flash means, make sure that the flash loan implementation 
is being implemented properly. Maybe you can do a flash loan and do some kind of callback on re-enter callback, open a new CDP with it. I don't know, with mess up with the accounting, you know. So try to think of all the possible states that the system can go through and all of the edge cases and how you can leverage every part of the system, flash means flash loans, liquidations to basically break it, right? This is your goal here during these two weeks to break the EBTC system, find as many vulnerabilities so they can be fixed and malicious actors will not exploit them once the protocol is deployed. Another thing that I recommend you to do is obviously check the previous security reports. All the reports that were mentioned, you know, Trust, Pyramid, Cantina, and obviously the Code Arena contest. And I highly recommend you to start with the Code Arena contest because this is the most recent one, the most updated one. Probably most of the issues already been fixed, but you want to get the most fresh point of view on the protocol, on the issues that it has. So definitely check out the most recent Code Arena report, which is already published in the Code Arena website. Now for every issue that you see in the protocol, check if they fix it, you know, maybe they claim that they fix it, but they forgot because there are plenty of issues and you know, developers tend to make mistakes. So maybe somewhere, somewhere between the lines, there was an issue that wasn't fixed. Maybe they didn't fix it properly, or maybe by fixing the issue, they, up, they opened another security vulnerability. So you definitely want to check every one of these raised issues and see if it was fixed properly. Do some kind of mitigation review to make sure that everything is correct. And if not, you want to report it. So these are some known issues from Liquidity that are probably going to be out of scope. We also have all the previous audit that you can check out both in the description of this video or also in other resources that I will give you at the end of this video. And we all obviously have the most recent C4 contest. You can head over to God Arena. Again, I will put the link in the description below and check the report for the most recent EBDC Badger DAO audit. And another thing that I recommend you to do is go through the recent pull request. The recent pull request in the EBDC repository contains all the new features and the fixes that were fixed from the recent audit in Code Arena. So you can see all the new commits, all the new pushed code to the repository. And I want you to go through every single one of them and make sure that there are no new vulnerabilities introduced. Uh, you can also use a checklist of vulnerabilities. You can go back to this list before the changes from Liquidity and also the areas to explore and check for every single commit. Maybe this one of these checklists is happening. Maybe you can do liquidations manipulation. Maybe you can front run users. Maybe you can break the protocol somehow, do the out of service attack. So always bear in mind all the state of the protocol and check every single commit, every single new line of code that was introduced to the protocol. And the most recent update is the most recent release 0.7 and they changed some stuff, not only fixed. Some of the stuff that they changed is in order to fix some issues that were raised from the previous security reviews, but some of them are just new features. For example, the way oracles worked changed, so you wanna check that out. Also, there were some uh, running issues with small amounts in edge cases that they fixed this code, these issues. They introduced some kind of new twa new TWAP time-weighted average price oracle to prevent flash loan attacks. And also they created two time locks. One is high sec and one is low sec for two types of operations that are more sensitive and less sensitive. And a pro tip from me to you, go to every commit, to every discussion, to the discussion of the pull request, to the discussion of the commits, to all the discussions that exist there, that you can see discussions of the issues in the Code Arena report, all these discussions between the wardens, to the protocol developers, to the team, and read them. Read through them, see how they thought, how the warden thought, how the developer thought, and try to think flaws in those discussions, in those new commits, in those new features. And this is where you might find some new issues, in my opinion. Now, this is a huge protocol, around 5,000 lines of code. That's why you have plenty of time to go through it slowly and work and find those issues. And obviously, in this video, we cannot cover everything and go through every single line of code and every smart contract. The idea of this video is to help you get started, to give you a high level overview of what is EBTC and what is this boost about. And if you want to dive deeper, these are some awesome resources that you can check out. I will put all the links in the description below. First of all, obviously, the documentation of EBTC, everything is explained here. We also have this amazing session 
with the team, the audit workshop from Code Arena that was pre the Code Arena contest. So it's like a one hour session. They have also part two and part three. So you can definitely check it out. There is this awesome markdown file, eBTC cheat sheet that links to all the resources, to the non-issues, to the docs, to everything you might need. So basically I would just send you to this awesome cheat sheet um, by Alex the Ent Entrepreneur. And we also have this awesome playlist that gives you a good overview of how BTC works, eBTC works, a bit more in-dive than this video. So if you want to dive deeper to every system, how liquidations work, how the invariant testing works, how to run them, you know, to the DAP, how the DAP work, the smart contracts, definitely check out this playlist by, um, by eBTC, by Alex the Entrepreneur, amazing playlist. And of course, the most recent release, the most recent PR, I will leave a link in the description below as well, where you can see all the features and fixes and the PRs that were added, everything, all the commits, you can see everything aggregated here. This is something that you definitely want to check out. Now let's summarize what we had today. First, we covered what are Immunify boosts and what is this particular eBTC boost is about. We've been through high-level protocol overview. We covered all the ins and outs of the protocol. How? What is this protocol about? How it works? About you know, depositing, redeeming, liquidations, flash loans, governance, price feeds, everything. We also took a look on, on the main smart contracts that basically implement all this protocol, all this architecture. What are the smart contracts that behind it? We took a look on all the file names. What are they responsible for? We also explored some previous audits and we saw how many issues and the timeline of all these audits. We discussed some potential attack vectors and areas that you want to explore in this boost. And I gave you some tips and ideas that for sure going to help you to get started with this boost. Thank you so much for watching this video, for learning with me about eBTC and about the current code base and the boost. And I wish you the best of luck in this Immunify boost.